Rock and Country Church. I think uh, last year's message must have worked. I mean, uh, last week's message must have worked. Man, we got we have a full house here tonight. God bless you. Glad everybody's here. Glad many of you who've been out sick. Glad you're here. And I am so glad that God will never leave me alone. Amen. Amen. And he'll never leave you alone either. He is always with you. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise that God gives us. And that's a promise you can stand on. You can take it to heart. You can take it to your, into your very soul and trust God to never leave you nor, nor forsake you. Does it mean that everything is going to be just perfect in life? Anybody ever lived that life yet? Not at all, right? <laughs> but it does mean that God is always going to be with you, and he carries us through the storms. He carries us through the storms. All right, we're going to pray up our children's church. Looks like we've got a bunch of kids here today, and that is great. I'm so blessed to see that. And Miss Terry's going to take you all back and beat you. I mean, take you all back and... and no, she's <laughs> no, she's going to take y'all back and love on you because that's what Miss Terry does. She loves kids. I don't know why, but she does. Okay, but anyway, uh, and I'm just teasing with that. Of course, I, we all love kiddos. But uh, anyway, so let's pray it up, and we'll get on with our teaching today. Uh, I think there, yeah, there's our uh, 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 scriptures for the day. So if you want to open your Bibles there. Now, we're not going there first. I think you know that, all right, or most of you do. Uh, folks who are visiting here today, God bless you. Glad you're here today. Hope you'll come back and stay and eat with us. It doesn't matter if you brought anything or not. Hey, we're going to have some good chow, and I promise I'll stay at the end of the line so that you get some, okay? So uh, glad you're here. God bless you all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for each and every day, Lord. We thank you for the breath of life itself. We thank you, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You are always with us. All we have to do, Lord, is call out to you. And you're always there. Always there. You're never not there for us. And we can rely on that and we trust in that. Father, open up our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits today so that we may receive your word, your message, Lord. Let it resonate in the hearts of our, in our very hearts, in our very souls, in our inner being, so that it may empower us to go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who are not here today. For those who are having to stay home today due to either illness or other means or other reasons, Father, I ask you to lay your hands on them and bless them so that you supply all of their needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus so that they can come and worship you with us and be part of the church. Father, we give you thanks and praise. We glorify your name in Jesus' name, that name above all names. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. Let's dismiss the kiddos and we'll get started with our teaching. Now, it's, uh, Johnny, as I told you earlier, and a couple of you other guys, as soon as uh, the kids get out, y'all go back there and guard those doors so nobody leaves, all right? We're going to lock these side doors. We, I don't want anybody jumping out and running out, all right? I got two questions for you. The first one is, can I, meaning you as well, can I be good enough? Can I be good enough? And the second one is, is can I be saved by works? I see a lot of head shaking no. I see a lot of head shaking no. Guard those doors. By the time we're done today, you will realize that you can be saved by works. Don't get up, run away, and don't throw anything. All right? Now, you're, I know you're saying to yourself, this guy is off his rocker. He has taught us and taught us and taught us and taught us. We cannot be saved by works. But we didn't finish the scripture there. There's a little bit more to the scripture than we, and we need to find out what that is. So bear with me, Okay? Just, just hang on. Don't, don't curse me. Don't throw anything. Let's just learn what the scriptures say. Because what I'm going to share with you today is right out of scripture. It's not something that I thunk up. It's not something that I said, oh, I have a new revelation because there is no new revelation. Okay? There's not any. 
If somebody ever comes to you and says, oh, God spoke to me last night, and I have a new revelation he told me to share with you. There is nothing new under the sun. Everything that we need to know is in this book right here. This is a complete book written by God. There is nothing missing, nothing needed to be added, nothing needed to be taken away. Now you're really thinking I'm off my rocker for what I just said a minute ago, right? Just stay with me, please. I would never, ever lead you astray. Not intentionally, anyway. So we're going to look in the depths of Scripture. These are two important questions that I feel many are tossed back and, and forth with. Uh, you know, our, our, even our churches sometimes say, oh, you got to do good. You got to do good. You got to be good. You got to be good. That's all works. Because in our society, we are encouraged to believe that we should have a high elevated expectation of ourselves so that we feel good about ourselves. Society is saying, yes, you are so awesome. You are so great. You're not perfect, but you're really close to it. You really need to feel good about yourself. Scripture teaches us that God so loved the world that he gave his begotten son whom he loved to die for each of us, each of us, not just me, not just you, but each of us and all who were born. John three sixteen. So we must be extremely valuable to him, right? Oh, I feel good about that. And we're, we're really extremely valuable for his kingdom. We're important. We're, we're, we're highly esteemed. Scripture even tells us that in a, in a couple of places. Scripture tells us that we are created for his good works, Ephesians 2.10, which he prepared for us. Well, if he, if he prepared good works for us, it must mean that we do good works. In Romans 8, 35 through 39, there is a scripture that tells us that nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing. Now, we just studied this in our Wednesday night Bible study, and, and Paul used things that are very common to man, very common to mankind, and then he started using other things that are, that are real, real to mankind, and, and then he said, and nothing that was ever created can separate you from God's love. So, we must be pretty important. We must be good enough for God to love. Right? Maybe not. Maybe not. So certainly we are good. And, and good enough. At least in our eyes we are. Many of us. And many of these scriptures are used so that people feel good about themselves. And it's okay to feel good about yourself. You're probably a really, really good person. But let me tell you, a lot of good people are going to hell. A lot of good people are going to go to hell. Now, I'm not a hellfire, damnation, fire and brimstone type guy, but I'm telling you, it is the truth. Jesus spoke more about hell than he spoke about heaven. So there is a hell, and we need to know that. Many of our churches, many of our churches, use these scriptures to give you a feel-good message. To give you a feel-good message. Pastors, many pastors, look at these scriptures and use them to fill up their church. I don't think last week I gave you a feel-good message when I said, those who are staying at home are not a part of the church. And you're not. You're a part of the ministry of the church, but you're not the church. I use the scripture where two or three are gathered, God is amongst us. Well, what that scripture says, and I explained this last week, what that scripture is actually saying is, is that whenever you, two or three of you who are in Christ, come together over a dilemma that you have, a question that you have, a problem that you have, uh, and something that you need God to answer so that you can make the right decision, that's when God is among you. You're not the church. When two or three are gathered, that's not the church. 
the church is everybody that is in here today. Everybody who is in other churches worshiping the Lord and, and listening to the word and understanding the word of God. That's the church, the body of believers, the body of Christ. That's what we went over, over and over and over. You cannot be the church when you're out here walking around outside. When you're sitting at home in your recliner in your pajamas watching it on TV. I'm at church today. <sighs> Maybe if I stay awake long enough. The church comes together as one and worships the Lord by the singing, the praising, the glorifying, the preaching of the word, the understanding of the word, the learning of the word, etc., etc. And people come to church. A lot of people come to church looking to leave with a feel good message. Oh, I feel so good about myself. I went to church today. I might even go again someday. And generally, whenever things are down, when people are down, when people are, things are going wrong, what do they do? They go to church. Let me share something with you. And I'm not a football fan at all. Baseball fan. Go Rangers. When this guy with the Buffalo Bills, 24 years old, had a heart attack and died, and died on the field, they brought him back. He died, all right? His body died. How many people knelt and prayed? The entire stadium knelt and prayed, basically. So when problems happen and problems arise, where do we go? We go to God. We go to God. Why? Because he is the answer to our prayers. And now this guy's talking. Can you imagine the prayers that went up for this guy? What about when one of our police officers are killed? Not so many prayers there. Well, when I, and this I just don't get. I don't care, but I don't get it. What about when an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old get killed by their father and grandfathers? Okay, who prayed for them? Okay, friend, when we're down and out and there's an issue and there's a problem, where do we go? We go to the Lord. That's who's going to take care of us. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now, you can try to do everything you own, on your own if you want to do it, but what would that be? That would be your works, wouldn't it? Sure, it would be. It would be your works. Why not go to the Lord and let him do it? After all, he's the one that spoke and said, let it be, and it was. Why not go to the source, right? Sure. But people want to come to church when they're down and out because they need a feel-good message. I'm sorry to say that really and truly our churches have misled people. This is not a feel-good world we live in. It's not a feel-good world. We need to understand that we need God in the biggest way, in the worst way, and we don't generally see it until some kind of catastrophe happens. And then we see when a young man, 24-year-old, falls down dead on a, on a football field, everybody comes to God. Why don't we come to God all the time? Why do we have to wait till something, some catastrophe like that happens, some horrible thing happens? Why do we have to wait? We are a praying church. We believe in prayer. Prayer is talking to God. We pray constantly through our service, and we pray constantly over this book and everybody that's in that book. We pray for them every, almost every day of every week. Prayer is just talking to God, the one who can supply all of our needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4. We want to feel good. But Jesus said, there's no one good but God. What? Yeah. The scripture tells us there is no one good but God. And each of these scriptures I shared with you just a minute ago, which we're going to talk about in a moment, there's something missing. We're not going to go there yet. But in each one of them, there is something missing that I didn't share with you. So we need to 
go back in a little bit and we're going to look at those. Well, actually, we're not even going to look at those. I'm going to let you look at those. And then I'm going to give you some other scriptures to look at to see how good you are. All right? Paul tells us, though, over in Romans 3, and you can go there if you want to. It's not our scripture today, but as you know, or most of you know, I use a lot of scripture because that's what God gives me. And what he gives me, I'm going to share with you. And we just covered this a little while back in our Wednesday night Bible study. But Paul tells us in Romans 3, starting at verse 10, you know, we want to be good people, right? As it is written, there was none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside and they have become unprofitable. There is none of who does good, no, not one. Paul tells us, Jesus told us, there is no one good but God. And also Paul is telling us, there is no one good but God. Their throat is like open tombs. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul says there is no one good, not one. Well, that must include us. So how are we going to have a feel-good message today if none of us are any good? Just wait. We'll get there. I promise. Isaiah 64, 6, you don't have to go there, but Isaiah 64, 6, Isaiah states, We have all been declared unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So everything I do right is like a filthy rag to God, right? Pretty much. Pretty much. Well, that ought to make you feel good. Everybody feeling good about themselves now? Oh, uh, well, Ephesians 2.8 tells us not anything we can do can save us, lest we boast about ourselves. Not anything we can do is going to save us, lest we boast about ourselves. Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, your works, my works, no flesh will be justified. Feeling good about yourself now? Not quite so much, huh? Again, even Jesus told us over in Mark 10, 18, he says, why do you call me good? Jesus the man now. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So how are you going to feel good about yourself? Well, I have some good news for you. I have some great news for you. From the time before anything was, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit knew and planned for you to be born in the time in which you were born. When you were created in your mother's womb, God planned that instant, that moment, before anything else was, God planned for you to be created. Not only that, they knew the triune God which we worship, the triune God knew each and every one of us where we would live, where we would work, where we would go to school, when we would get married, when we would get divorced, when we'd have kids, when we'd have grandkids. All the events of your life, including sitting here today, God knew about before anything else was. That makes you feel pretty important to God, right? But you're not good. So how good do you feel now? God knew when you would deny him. Has anyone never denied God? Oh, well, I don't think so. 
Has God ever told you to go to church and you didn't go to church? Then you denied him. Has God ever told you to pray and you didn't pray? Then you've denied him. Has God ever told you to open up your scripture and read something in the book because he had a message for you and you didn't do it? You've denied him. Have you ever put anything before God for any reason whatsoever? Cowboys don't play till three, so you don't have to worry about that. Have you ever put anything before God? Then you've denied him. And what is the very first commandment that God gave us? Thou shalt not have any God before me. See, you've made something your God. We've all done it, friends. Every one of us have done it. So we're maybe not so good. But you know what else God knew? God knew when you would finally surrender to him as well. God knew when you would finally say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. And truly mean it in your heart. And scripture tells us all of heaven rejoices when one sinner comes home. Wow. I'm feeling a little bit better about myself. A little bit. But there's still a small problem that you and I have. Even though we have surrendered, our works that we do are never perfect. They're never perfect. We even today sometimes deny God. We even today don't go to Bible study. We even today don't do a Bible study on our own. We even today don't sing his praises in certain things. We wait until a catastrophe hits and before we come to him and ask him to help us out. Why do we wait? Why not go to him first? Many of us get up every morning and we say, thank you, Lord, for this day. Let me live for you this day. Never for myself. How many of you get up and say, oh man, I got to go to work today. And then just dread getting up and getting dressed and going to work. Many of us do that. We don't even forget about God. I mean, we don't even remember God. We forget about him. Instead of saying, hey God, won't you help me out today with my work? Come on along with me and work with me, all right? Show me what I need to do today. Help me make it through the day. And then at the end of the day, thank him for being with you all day long. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you, but yet we want to do it on our own, right? We want to make sure we take care of everything, especially us guys. We still fall short of the glory of God every day. Romans 3.23. We fall short of his glory every day. We forget about him until we really need him. And then we expect him to be there to bail us out. Even when we do something that's maybe not right. Something that doesn't please him. So let's look over at Romans 3. Look at Romans 3, verse 23. Romans 3, verse 23. It says, all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. That includes all of us. The scripture is not a liar. Scripture tells the truth. And it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Is anybody, not, is anybody here who has never sinned in their life? Please don't raise your hand. So therefore, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Have we not? We're not that good. But let's continue on a little bit. Now, now that we're feeling not so good about ourselves, let, let's look a little bit farther at Scripture instead of just taking one Scripture and condemning ourselves. Let's take it a little bit farther and let's look at verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. That's payment. Payment. Propitiation, propitiation by his blood through faith, through trusting God to demonstrate 
His righteousness, not ours, His righteousness, because in His forbearance, that means He pre-knew, He already knew, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. In other words, you have never paid for your sins. Now, you may have paid some consequences for your sins, but you've never paid for your sins. We're going to see what that is here in just a little bit. To demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, capital H, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of those whose faith is in Jesus. See, God justifies us because of our faith in Christ, not because of our works, because we've already seen over and over and over, we ain't good. We sure ain't good enough, but pretty simply, we ain't good. Matter of fact, in... uh, uh, Ephesians uh, 2.10, it says that we're actually enemies of God. What did God do with his enemies over in the Old Testament? Wiped them out. They died by the millions and billions. You ain't dead yet. You're still alive and kicking. Maybe not as high, but you're still alive and kicking. <clears throat> so God sent somebody else to do the works that God required. It's a requirement. God requires sin to be paid for by blood, by death. Your sins, my sins, everybody's sins. You and I are so loved that he sent salvation as a free gift Listen now, it's free. Well, what's it going to cost me? It's free. Well, how much, what all I got to do for it? It's free. Can we say it's free? One, two, three. Free. It is free. It is a free gift God is giving to you. Do you realize that if you had to pay for it, it would not be a gift, and it certainly wouldn't be free. So God is giving you the opportunity to receive a free gift that costs you nothing, nothing. To those, to those, and only those, it's not for everybody. Let me rephrase that. It is for everybody, But not everybody will receive the free gift. And what is the free gift? Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, I know. He died for my sins. Jesus did so much more. So, so, so very much more. So what is faith in Jesus? He died for our sins. Yeah, we all know that, right? What did Jesus come to do? Oh, he came to die for my sins. That's it. That's all he did. Well, okay, let's back up a little bit. Okay, he died for your sins. So that means your sins are paid for. But if he died and is still dead, then you're going to die and you're going to be dead too. You see, we leave off the part sometime that he rose again. See, not only did he die... But he rose again, and he is alive today. Amen? Can I get an amen? Amen. Our Jesus is alive. You know, he is the only one that leads any and every religion, if you will, throughout the entire world that is alive. All the rest of them are dead. He is not. He is alive. Scripture clearly tells us that he is alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and I. Romans 8. Not only did he pay your sin debt and my sin debt, but he did so much more. So we want to briefly look at the the life of Christ and what he did. First, God became a man. God became a man. Emmanuel. 
Matthew 1, 23. God became a man just like you and I, or men, women, etc. He became a human being. The invisible God that caused everything into being became a man before anything else was, but then he reincarnated himself, if you will, to a baby so that he could live the same life, come into this world the same way you and I came into the world. Anybody here born by anything other than their mom? I mean, if you are, I'd really like to talk to you because I want to see what's going on in that neck of the woods. No, Jesus was born of a woman just like you and I. He came into this world as a baby. We talked about this in the Christmas message. And he was born in Bethlehem, as Scripture says. But guess what? He moved. They moved down to Egypt. Then they started to come back to Bethlehem. Then they moved up to Nazareth. So he moved around a little bit. He grew up to at least 12 years old, Scripture tells us, over in the book of Luke. Where we see he went to church. Jesus went to church. It was called the temple, but he still went to church. So why don't we go to church? Oh, I'd rather stay at home and sit in my pajamas and watch it on TV. Well, you know, if you have to do that, that's all fine and good. Again, we do our live stream and we just spent a lot of money in order to improve our live stream for those on the other side of the world. And we have people in India, Africa, uh, Scotland, England, uh, Australia, and all over the United States that follow this little church through our live stream service. All over the world. Because they can't get here. Because they're on the other side of the world. That's a pretty good excuse. But then there's also people who are sick and, and can't get out of bed that watch us. There are people who don't have the means to get to church and they watch us. So therefore we do that service and part of the ministry of the church in order to reach those people, in order to try to feed those people the word of God, the message of God. Because they can't get here. That's understandable. That's acceptable by all means. But the people who refuse to come because they're too cotton picking lazy to get out of their chair, that's not a reason. That's not a reason. Matter of fact, we're supposed to give God our best. And if our best is not getting up out of bed and time to go, that's not your best. I guarantee you if somebody says, hey, free meal today, they'd be here, right? You bet. That's why I come. No, it's not. I make sure I'm here the first week of every, every month, right? No, I don't. Y'all know that. I hope. But we have to understand that there is a reason for that ministry. And it is to reach those who cannot be here for whatever reason. And that's perfectly fine. But Jesus grew up going to church. He became a leader. And by teaching others, he was favored by God and men. You can read this over in uh, Luke 2, 40 through 52, if you want to jot that down. Luke 2, 40 through 52. He led a sinless life during his entire 33 and a half years. He was devoted to God the Father and to the works God had laid out before him. God gave Jesus. He even told us, he says, I came to do the works of my Father, not the works of myself. I came to do as my father tells me to do. He came to be obedient to the father and to show us that we too could live a life as he lived. Have we done that? None of us have because there is no one righteous, no, not one. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Now we can blame it on Adam all day long and I do and I'm going to go up to Adam whenever I get there and I'm going to say, Adam, Dude, what were you thinking? You should have ate a banana. Okay? Come on. Now, we don't know if it was, it, all we know is it was a fruit. We don't know, uh, well, actually, we do know what it is, but it wasn't an apple, all right? Jesus was baptized, as God describes we are to be done. Baptized. 
He obeyed God's law to, the, to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness, Matthew 3.15, if you want to jot that down. Matthew 3.15, he came and he was baptized and he told John the Baptist, he says, I must be baptized by you in order to fulfill all righteousness. Because God required it. He kept his law, the God's law, throughout his entire life. He even stated in Matthew 5, 17, I did not come to destroy the law or to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. What law? The law of obedience. The same law that Adam broke, if you will, or disobeyed in the Garden of Eden disobedience the exact same law that we break or disobey on a constant basis disobedience well I don't know what all God requires of me I mean we have Bible study what four times a week basically plus on Sunday whenever we do because uh, we teach scripture we have Bible study five times a week what else do you need there are thousands of ministries out there that you can watch. You have, hopefully you have a Bible at home. Open it up and read it yourself. Matter of fact, Jesus even tells us over in John uh, 16, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he will teach you all things I want you to know. It's up to you. You want to know what God wants for your life? The first thing that he wants for your life, which is uh, John 6 and 40, I believe it is, or 42, he says, is for you to believe in Jesus Christ so that you can receive eternal life. That is the will God has for your life. Is to believe in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Oh, but you mean it's not about me? But... I need to feel good about myself. When you compare yourself to others, you probably do feel good about yourself because you're a good person. But when you call, compare yourself to Christ, you fall short of the glory of God. And believe me, friend, so do I. So do I. Throughout the life of Christ, he shows us how God wants us to live. So we don't look at, the, at the, the life of other people. We look at the life of Christ. That's what scripture is about. It is about Jesus. He is the example to follow. Can we do it? Have we done it? No, not one, according to the scriptures. Not even one of us. Now, I know that Ted and Beverly and Carolyn and, and uh, Claude and Johnny and a couple of you others, I mean, y'all probably pretty close to Jesus. But when I look at my life and compare it to Jesus, wow, I got a long way to go. I got a long, 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 long way to go. Philippians 1 and 6, he will complete what he starts in me, and he will. So therefore, God came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, which is to pay the payment that had to be paid. It has to be paid. God is a holy God. He doesn't go back on his word. It has to be paid. What is that payment? That payment is somebody's blood, somebody's life. To pay for all the old sins of, of, of years gone by? To pay for the present sins of today? And to pay for the sins that will be done by tomorrow and on through the future? Wow, that'd take a pretty, uh, pretty awesome person to pay for all that, right? Doesn't really take an awesome person. What it takes is, is a sinless person. Someone who has not sinned, because if he has sinned, then he has already uh, uh, failed to glorify God because he has sinned. Even one little bitty sin. Wait a minute, you mean I, I can go to hell for one little bitty sin? In James 2.10, it tells us that if you've broken the least of the commandments, you've broken them all. 
You've broken them all. And if you want to sit down and actually talk one-on-one about it, I can probably pick out from your brain, from your life, where you have broken all ten of the commandments. All ten of them. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, but Jesus never did. He fulfilled the law by being obedient to the law all the way to death on the cross. He was the sacrifice. He was the atoning sacrifice that paid and fulfilled God's law. And he paid the price for all past sins, all present sins, and all future sins. But not for everybody. Wait a minute. Not for everybody. So who's he going to leave out? He's not going to leave out anybody. But someone is going to leave themselves out. Somebody's going to leave themselves out. What did I just share with you a minute ago? James 6, I mean John 6 and 40, I believe it is. God's will for your life is that all will come to know Jesus Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior and receive the free gift of eternal life. So you have to do something. It's not the works that you do, but you have to do something. You have to make a choice. Boy, I don't know, Woody, that's just too hard to do. I mean, it might just exhaust me to make a choice on something. You mean I got to think about it? You mean I have to sit there and figure it out? Man, that's exhausting. I'd rather just sit in my chair and rock back and forth. In Romans 6, Romans 6, 23, God says... The wages of sin is death. Somebody has to pay this this price. Because sin has to be paid for by the death of someone, of someone who is perfect enough to be that blemish-free sacrificed. That means no sin. And none of us make that. None of us qualify. None of us are good enough. Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even if you've done one little bitty white lie, it nullifies you from being righteous. One little lie. Well, I told a lie one time, you know, when I was about three, my mom tells me. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Right. Let's go to, well, you don't have to go there, uh, but I want to share this with you, and you can write this down and see it later. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, 18.4, it states, even in the Old Testament, behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Now, these are small f, small s. In other words, and he's not, I'm not trying to leave out ladies, but the Bible was actually written, if you will, it was written to men. All right? I mean, that's how they wrote it. It was written to men. Today, it is certainly open to any woman having it and sharing it and and, and, uh, being blessed by it. Don't think that it's not. But in the days of the writings of the Bible, it was written to men. Because men, I used this last week, men, we are to be the leaders of our families. We are to take the word of God and share it with our families. Now look over at Ephesians uh, 5. Is it 5? Yeah, 5 uh, starting at 21 where it says, uh, Ephesians 5 and 21, and it says, um, ah! now that aggravates me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just find it real, real quick. It won't take but a sec. That's Colossians, Philippians. I wasn't, this wasn't a part of my notes, but it just came to me real, real quick. Uh, Submit to one another. Thank you for reminding me. I couldn't think of this word submit. Submit to one another as unto God. Submit to one another as unto God. So it's just as good for the woman as it is for the man. Don't think that it is not. But guys, we are called to be the leaders of our families. We are called to be the spiritual leaders of our family. And if we do not do that, 
then guess what? Our ladies will pick up the slack. They've already done that. They've already done it. But in Ezekiel 18 and 4, it says, Behold, all souls are mine. That includes ladies as well, all right? The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. It's right out of the book. So if you've ever sinned, your soul is destined to hell. Wait a minute. I'm still a young, I'm still a young person. I haven't sinned that bad. The soul that sins will die. How plain is God's word? How simple is God's word? Very, very. So let's go and look at our scripture today. What? Finally? Yeah. First Peter 2. First Peter 2, starting at 21. First Peter 2, 21. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us. And put your name there. He suffered for you. Leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. Now, that's simply saying that you should follow as he lived, you should live. That's, that's not hard to understand. It doesn't mean that you're going to walk in his footsteps. You'd have to go over to Israel to do that, which I hope to go someday, but you can walk in his footsteps. You can walk in his steps by walking as he walked. You're not going to be perfect, and God knows that. Are you feeling better about yourself, I hope? Kind of a toss-up, isn't it? Just hang in there. Verse 22. Who committed no sin that would cry, was Christ, nor was deceit found in his mouth? Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return? I mean, has anybody ever said anything bad to you and you turned around and snapped right back at them? You have sinned. What? I'm just getting them back. Vengeance is mine, so says the Lord. Right? Jesus didn't, re he didn't revile back. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Anybody do you any harm and you said, hey, I'm going to get you back. You've sinned. But committed himself to him, God, who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, died for you and me, that we have died to sin, might live, who have died from sin, we who have died from sin, that means we're sinners, because sin has overpowered us at some point in time, and we have sinned. Now, please, 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 everybody understand. God knows since the fall in the garden, we were all going to sin. He knows that. And he knew that you were not capable of living a sinless life. Now, that's not an excuse to sin. That's an excuse or a reason to realize you need a Savior. By whose stripes we are healed. Now, what does it mean? We use this all the time. By whose stripes, by whose stripes we are healed. We're going to get into a little bit deeper of that in just a minute. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. The shepherd, the overseer of your souls. That's Christ. That's Christ living in you. Let's go over to Isaiah 53. I do want you to go there, please. Isaiah 53. It's way over in the Old Testament. Before uh, Jeremiah, after the Psalms and Proverbs, after the Song of Solomon, Isaiah 53. If you can find that kind of promptly. I hear some pages flipping, so I'll wait just a minute. Do you want, I do want you to see the scripture. I debated whether this was going to be our scripture for today, but God said, no, it's going to be over in 2 Peter, or 1 Peter. All right, everybody there? I hope. Starting at verse 1, Isaiah 53, verse 1. 
Who has believed in our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord means his, his word coming out to you, him reaching out to you and explaining and sharing and, and bringing you along, helping you along. The hand of the Lord reaching out to you. It reaches out to each and every person who reaches their hand out. You ever seen a picture with, with Jesus like this? No. Now, of course, we know that nobody had a camera back then, all right? But the depiction through men's minds, is always his hands extended out towards us. Always. Always. He's never like this. Never. He's always extending his desire to be with you, to you, and to me. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, what is that scripture saying right there? Jesus was just a regular old Joe. Jesus the man, he appeared as a regular old Joe. He was, he was as simple as I was. He was as simple as Barry was. He was as simple as, as uh, Mike was. He, he was. he was just a person. There was nothing about him that would draw you to him except, except the love of God that lived in through him. There was nothing about his nature, his, his, his human nature that would draw you to him. He was despised and rejected by men, the men of sorrows inadequate and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. We didn't even acknowledge that he was God. Now, this is the Old Testament, okay? And it's just simply saying is, and this is still true today. Many people do not, even the Jews do not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Surely he was born, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Here we go. This is what he did, did for you. These are his works. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We know God turned his back on him, on him for three hours, right, on the cross. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And chast chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. There it is again. We are like sheep gone astray. We have turned from everyone who, to his own. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sins of us all. He put it all on Jesus. Every bit of it. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He died. He suffered the wages of sin, which is death. He died. The man, Jesus died for the transgressions of my people he was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth he was sinless yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him this was God's plan for this man Jesus to die for us and all who would believe. He, was, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul to be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many Amen, 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 amen. I'm one of the many. I pray you are as well. For he shall bear their iniquities. He shall bear our sins. Those of us who are still living, he shall bear our sins. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. 
You see that? Jesus died. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Wow. The works of Christ. What he did for you and me. What does it mean when we read, and we've read it twice, by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. It's the fact that he took our sins upon himself and suffered a crucifixion death to die to pay the sins, the atoning Sacrifice he made for your sins and for my sins. Why? Because God loves you. Because he loves you. We can be healed from the wages of sin under one condition. There's only one, one condition that you must meet. And you must meet it. Jesus told Peter, asked Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus says, it was not man that gave you that message, but only the Father in heaven gave you that message. You see, you and I have to have Christ in order to stand before a righteous God. We have to. Remember I said over in, um, in a few, uh, uh, earlier in the, a few verses over in John 3, Romans 8, Ephesians 2, and many, many others, that there was something left out. If you go back and read those, you will see, and I intentionally left it out. If you go back and read those, they are all concluded with in Christ. In Christ. There is no way whatsoever that you will ever get to heaven except in Christ. It is not by your works. It is not by my works. It is only by the works of Christ. It is by his works that you can be saved. But it is by works. Because if Jesus did not do what he did, then he would still be dead in the grave. But he rose again and he ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Today, today he is there interceding for you and I. So it is by the saving works of Christ that we can be saved. Not our works. Because we ain't good, right? You feel a little bit better about yourself? <laughs> okay, I hope so. Because God does love you. Jesus died for you so that you could spend eternity with God, with him. That was the works that he did. And he didn't just do it on the cross. He did it the moment he was born. From the moment God says, hey, you're going to be born and put in a feed trough. And he goes, What? I don't want to be laid in a feed trough. I don't want swaddling clothes around me. I want some nice robe, you know, a nice a kingly robe and a crown and all that stuff. He has all that now. He has all that now. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. But he came to this earth as a simple child, the same way you and I came into this world. And he lived a sinless life. And he did so many things to show us how to live our lives. The question is, is do we do it? Oh, no, I, you know, I just want to get saved. And once I get saved, then I'll just live like hell, like I want to, until, uh, until I die. Well, there has to be proof of your salvation. Oh, in the book of James, it says it works without deeds. Faith without deeds. Faith without deeds, not faith, uh, well, not work. Faith without deeds is dead. Absolutely dead. 
Why did James say that? James said that because if there's not a change in you, you're probably not saved. Now, I'm not passing a judgment here, and I'm not saying that anybody, if they're still living their old ways, I'm not saying they're saved or not because that's between you and God. But if there is not an evidence of your salvation, a change in you, that new creation living a new life, let the old pass away and the new come, if it is not existing in your life, then you might want to think about whether you're saved or not. Because you don't know when your next breath is going to be the last one you take. That boy that uh, Hamlin, I think his name is, the football player. And I say boy, not disrespectfully, he's 24. To me, I got a kid that's fixing to be 50, okay? So to me, he's a, he's a young boy, a young man. He didn't know that he was going to die on that football field. I'm not telling you he just he had a heart attack and laid there. No, that boy died. He literally died. He didn't know that that was going to happen. I guarantee you he'd have never made the tackle if he knew that that was going to happen. We don't know when our last day is. We don't know when we're going to inhale and exhale in heaven. Or hell. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen as appointed once for man to die. And that will happen. So we have to be ready. We have to be ready. In Christ. In Christ. Let's say that. In Christ. There is no other way. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through him. John 14, 6. Jesus did all types of works to show us his righteousness. His righteousness. His righteousness. In other words, he lived a perfect, sinless life. And now God glorified him by seating him in the right hand of the Father. And that gives him, and only him, absolutely no one else throughout the entire history and throughout the history to come, it gives him the only right to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Nobody else has that right. Remember when James and John says their mother came to Jesus and says, hey, I want you to let my boy sit next to you, okay, when you get to heaven there? And Jesus says, the Father appoints who's going to sit at the right and left. Jesus says, this is the right. I hope I get to sit on the left. Or actually, I just hope I get to sit up there in heaven next to him. Anywhere next to him. Be fine with me. But he is the only one that has and is complete righteousness in the eyes of God. The only one. And that's good news. Why is that good news? For through the obedience of Christ all the way to death on the cross, he paid, he paid the payment of our sins that was demanded of God. It was demanded of God. When we believe, when we believe, now get this, because you have to believe the word of God. You can't just say, oh yeah, that sounds real good. That's a real good story. No, you have to, in your heart of hearts, you have to believe, you have to trust God that the works of Christ, the atoning works of Christ paid for your dead sin. And by faith, you receive him in your heart as Lord of life itself. Whether you agree with it or not really doesn't make any difference. But do you realize that Jesus is the Lord of Beverly and Ted's life? He's the Lord of uh, Colleen's life. He's the Lord of Brenda's life. He's the Lord of, of uh, Jerry's life. He's the Lord of my life. He's the Lord of everybody's life. Oh, well, I don't think I really believe that. It don't matter whether you believe it or not. He's still Lord of Lord and King of Kings. You don't get to rewrite the book. Our salvation is given as a free gift that has been paid for by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. For by faith we receive his righteousness. For we don't have any, any righteousness of our own. There's no one righteous, no, not one. Romans 3. 
Not one person other than Jesus. So we receive his righteousness, therefore having the righteousness of God, God himself having the righteousness of him, of Jesus, the incarnate God, we have, we have, we have a right standing with God. Not on our works, on his works. We can have a right standing with God. God doesn't see us. He sees Jesus living in us. Oh, well, that's really kind of more than I can understand. Doesn't matter whether you understand it or not. You know, it doesn't even matter if you accept it or not. Because it's not up to you. The word says, when God looks upon us and sees Jesus in us, we have right standing with God. God the Father. We have right standing with him. That's what righteousness is. It means he looks at us sees his son who sacrificed himself for our sins and paid the atoning price for our sins and he sees our sins no more. Oh yeah, I remember that scripture that says, oh yeah, and I'll remember their sins no more. I, no, no, no. God don't forget nothing. God doesn't forget anything. He knows everything. He just simply chooses, because you have Christ, he simply chooses to not bring to his remembrance all the crap you've done in your life. He does. He says, well, I'm not going to look at the stuff that what he did. I'm going to look at my son, whom I love. Remember the three times Jesus spoke from heaven? I mean, from God, God spoke from heaven. He spoke about Jesus. He says, this is my son. Listen to him. In him, I am well pleased. He looks at you and sees Jesus, his beloved son, that he sent to die for you and me. Wow, would you send your son and daughter to die for me? I would hope not. I would hope not. But God loves you that much. Not that you're good, because you have no goodness. You have none. Oh, but I'm a pretty good person. I want you to feel good about yourself. You probably are a pretty good person. But let me tell you this. There's a lot of good people in hell. And there's a lot of good people going to hell. Why? Because they don't accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Because that's God's law. That's what God set. It's only by the works of Jesus, our Savior, that any of us are allowed to get into heaven. Here's some scriptures you can look up to see in Christ Jesus, if you want to write them down. John 3, 16. We all know that. Okay? Romans 8, 1. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? Romans 8, 31 through, or 35 through 39. Primarily verse 37. 1 Corinthians six twenty. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Awesome scripture. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 13. In every one of them, it is in Christ Jesus. In Christ. God loves you and wants you to become a part of his kingdom. But that can only happen. It can only happen. It can only happen by you putting your trust, having faith into the sacrificial atoning works of Jesus. No other way. No other way. There is no way to get through the gates of heaven. Now you can get through the gates of hell. All you got to do is walk on. But there is no way to get into the gates of heaven. Jesus says no one comes through the, to the Father except through me. Jesus says the road is wide that many will follow. But the, the way is narrow to the gate that leads into heaven. It's narrow. The road is narrow. The road's small. Many will not find it. Why? Because they think that they're good enough. I hope you do feel good about yourself because you're good people. But good people do not go to heaven. People who receive Jesus Christ according to the laws of God 
people who receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior go to heaven by trusting into the, wor into the sacrificial works of Jesus. Can you go to heaven by works? By Jesus' works. And only Jesus' works. No other way. No other way. I pray that you will that you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and trust and believe in the works of Christ. Well, I want to know more about these works. Open your Bible. It's all right there. It was written over 2,000 years ago for you to read right now. It's a love letter written to you. The entire 66 books is a love letter written to you and written to me. It is not written to unbelievers. What? Now, it's for unbelievers if they'll open it up, but if they're not going to believe it and receive it, then it's not for them. Unbelievers are not entitled to the blessings of God. Unbelievers do not get into heaven. Only those who receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are allowed to get into heaven. So if you want to know how to get to heaven, open your book. That's why we only teach the word here. We only teach the word. I'm, I hope you don't feel as though I've tried to preach to you because I'm worse than you are, I guarantee you. And I don't want to tell you how bad you are. You already know that. At least Johnny does. I, I'm, I'm sorry. We all should know how bad we are, right? But I want you to know how good God is. And God died for you. He, he sacrificed himself for you. The only qualifying sacrifice that could be given for your sins so that you could get into heaven. But the clause is, is you, the little writing at the bottom, the little writing at the bottom, you know, little small letters that nobody ever reads. You must accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's that simple. Oh, that's too easy. No, it's that simple. It's that simple. But you have to truly do it. Oh, well, I want to get saved. I might die tomorrow, so I better get saved today. You have to mean it in your heart. You have to mean it in your very soul and your spirit. And you have to speak it out. Now, you don't have to come and tell me. You don't have to tell your neighbor. You don't have to tell your wife, your husband. Okay? But you must confess to God. You must cry out to Jesus. And Scripture says, those who call on his name shall be saved. So let's do that. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I ask them to call out to you. Now, it's not just a simple thing of saying, Jesus, make me your Lord. And make, I make you my Lord and Savior and come into my heart and be my Savior. It's not that. God knows your heart. You must mean it in your heart. You must mean it in your very soul. You must mean it in your spirit. And then God hears you and knows that it is true. You can say the words, but how many times have we just said words like, God, please get me out of this, and if you will, I'll never do it again. So if that's you today and you have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you want to do that today, mean it in your heart. If you don't mean it in your heart, please don't waste your time or his. But call on the name of Jesus. Just say, but mean it in your heart. Dear Jesus, I have sinned. I have fallen short of the expectations that you have for me and the reason that you created me. I have fallen short of that. So, Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, all of my sins, and I know you will because you're a faithful God. I ask you to come into my life be the Lord of my life. Guide me and direct me for your glory and your glory alone. Nothing of mine but your glory and your glory alone. And I will follow you from this day forward. Seeking your wisdom. Seeking your guidance. And basking in your love. That you will pour out on me. Because your goal, your... your 
your desire is to love me. You created me to have that relationship with you. To love you and to be loved by you. And Father, I ask you to help me with this. And I give you all the glory and the praise. In your precious son, Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. All right. If anybody needs prayer whatsoever, please come forward and let us pray for you. We would love to pray for you.